Thank you. Ah, being recorded. It's official. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Luke. I appreciate it. Right. Yeah, no problem. Three, four, five. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. Welcome for thank you. Welcome and thank you so much for coming. Uh, we're gonna wait just a minute in case a few more people show up. But uh, I'm Jenny McFarland with the Tucson Audubon Society. That's Luke, also with the Tucson Audubon Society. He helped set up this meeting, this uh, on the Zoom. Helped us with all the the Zoom. He's our, our Zoom wrangler. And then of course we have Tess. Tess, you want to introduce yourself? Yeah. Hey everyone. I'm Tess Wagner. I am the Watershed Restoration Program Manager at Borderlands Restoration Network. Um, so yeah, I'm working with Jenny to make sure these surveys. Uh, happen and everything like that. So thank you all so much for coming. Yeah, this is great. And this is this is a really important, I'm really glad you're all here. I really appreciate you all being here because it's the first time that we've really tried anything quite like this. This is a really big important step for the Arizona Important Bird Areas program. And if you're not familiar with that program, we will talk about that. <laughs> what is the IBA program? Um, but so IBA program it has been around for a long time. It's been around for 14 years in Arizona, but it's been around nationally or internationally, excuse me, for decades. But it's a really cool program. And in Arizona, it's been very active. And the fact that we're collaborating with Borderlands Restoration Network is something, the sort of thing we've wanted to do for a long time. And we're finally taking that step and, and using um, our amazing volunteers and our established bird survey protocols to help other projects and other uh, organizations uh, succeed in, in their projects. So lots of organizations do amazing work like Borderlands Restoration Network, which we'll hear about from Tess, but they're missing that key component that'll, that can be very important just in terms of interest and in tracking a study, but also in terms of funders <laughs> wanna see uh, results of, of work that happens. And bird surveys is an excellent way to do that. So we have a lot of bird survey expertise and people who have expertise in bird identification. And now we can use those skills and you know, uh, skill sets, a base of information and protocols and data sheets and all that and a database online to then further other projects, which is such an important uh, collaboration. And we're really glad to, to be a part of this. So and I'm really, really grateful for all of you to be here. So uh, I am recording this session and this will be available on uh, YouTube. So I will send this link out to everyone who signed up, including those who couldn't be here today at the session. And then of course, Thursday, we're doing an in-person training session down near Patagonia, which we'll talk about exactly how to get there at the end. And I will be offering sort of a follow-up second chance opportunity to do a field, a field visit, you know, to do a training later in the summer for those who can't make the one this Thursday or for new people who pop up between now and then who wanna participate in this effort. So if you wanna to, to go ahead, Tess, if you wanna do your, your part explaining the, the larger project. Sure, yeah. So hold on, let me, okay, share screen. All right, is that, that should be showing up for y'all, is that? Okay, cool. All right, so um, as I said, my name is Tess Wagner and I'm the Watershed Restoration Program Manager at uh, BRN. Um, and first of all, I wanted to say, yeah, thank you everyone for being here and thank you Jenny for organizing this because we really would not be able to accomplish this work um, without you or with all, without all of you amazing volunteers um, who have you know, these skills in bird identification um, and who are willing to give your time to this project. So really, thank you so much. Um, we wouldn't be able to do it without you. Um, so I'm gonna provide a little bit of background on Borderlands Wildlife Preserve, which is uh, the site for this project. Um, and then I will also uh, be going into um, a little bit more about the project details. Um, so what, what else uh, has been going into this project and kind of how these surveys fit into the restoration work we've been doing. So I'm going to start with a little bit of history. Um, so here up here you can see that this, these are the Santa Rita Mountains, here are the Patagonia Mountains, uh, and here are the Huachuca Mountains. Um, and so in 2004, um, the Arizona Game and Fish Department funded research by Northern Arizona University um, to identify the critical 
uh, migration corridors between some of the southern sky islands. Um, and, and what they found, what they came up with was that this Sonoida Creek wildlife um, corridor, which is right here, you can see in blue, um, this corridor was the most important landscape connection uh, for jaguar uh, to pass into the Santa Rita Mountains, um, and also uh, very important for black bear, um, deer, and then mountain lions as well. Um, so at the time that they, that they identified this connection is really important. Um, these two areas right here were privately owned. Um, and then all of this green, this is um, Coronado National Forest. So there are these two um, privately owned pieces of land right in between that really, you know, um, it's a small area, but they really provide that critical connection. Um, so unfortunately, soon after this study came out, um, this area in green, which is now Borderlands Wildlife Preserve, um, it began undergoing development. Um, so the developer, the initial plan was to put, I think it was 189 residential plots on this area, which is something like 1200 acres. Um, and so that would have, you know, pretty much destroyed this, this connectivity. Um, and the developer got going, he put in um, some paved roads, he got in water lines, I think electric lines as well. Um, so he really started getting in some of the infrastructure um, and actually sold, I think 12 of the um, plots um, of land. Uh, but then 2008 happened and um, the, the property was foreclosed um, before most of it got developed. Um, so this, this really provided, you know, 2008, there was a lot of, there were a lot of difficulties, um, you know, from that time, and we're still seeing that today. But this was one, you know, kind of <laughs> bright thing that happened with this piece of land anyways, was that it was the development there was halted. Um, and this really gave the opportunity for a bunch of um, local concerned um, citizens uh, who were concerned with this connectivity and this, you know, knew about this corridor, this gave them the opportunity to figure out how to conserve it, basically. Um, so this effort was led by Ron Pulliam, um, who is also the founder of Borderlands Restoration Network. Um, and he got a bunch of investors together and they, they were able to buy this land. Um, and they, uh, they formed Wildlife Corridors LLC, which is now the owner of this, of this land, and it's now called Borderlands Wildlife Preserve. Um, and it, we, so Borderlands Restoration Network, we help manage uh, the land. So we do a lot of restoration work um, in, this, in this area. Um, so here's a closer look at it. We actually recently acquired some more land, or Ron did, and Wildlife Corridors uh, acquired some more land on the other side. So really, you know, uh, moving, you know, this piece right here, essentially, uh, really helping us get, um, you know, more connectivity uh, that will be conserved. Um, and all of this is under, I think all of it right now is under conservation easement or is in the process of getting there. There may be a few parcels that aren't quite there yet. But um, anyways, it's all under conservation easement. So it's all protected. There is this little section here in gray at the bottom that um, this was where the roads were put in. So all this yellow, these were all the uh, roads that were put in by the developer. Um, and there are some, some residents, um, residential plots here. I think 2024 uh, were put up for sale um, in this area, but they're again, they're under conservation easement. So the, the building footprints are very limited and where they can go and how big they can be. And then most of the landscape around is uh, preserved um, and not allowed to be touched. Um, so this area does have a little bit of development in it, uh, but the majority of the wildlife preserve, everything you see in green, um, all of that is really um, preserved. So that's, that's really exciting. Um, and it really uh, preserves this critical landscape connection. Um, so I'm going to move on and talk a little bit more about the details of this project. So we have a whole bunch of projects, different restoration projects going on all over the preserve. Uh, but this one in particular that you'll be helping us with, um, this one is funded by Sonoran Joint Ventures. Um, and the, the goal of this project is to restore quail habitat um, at the preserve. And this is our second year of funding for this project. So we got funding 2019 to 2020, and now we're in the second year going through uh, fall of this year. Um, and this year we have a little under $13,000 to work with. Um, and the, the SJV is a really, uh, they're, they're a great um, 
they form some really great partnerships. They're headed by the Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, but their whole mission is all about conserving unique birds and, and their associated habitats of the southwestern U.S. and uh, Mexico. Um, so, you know, they're, they're pretty critical um, in figuring out how to maintain, you know, um, habitat for the, the really special birds that we have in this area. Um, so of course, Montezuma quail is one of them. So, so that's how, how they've, um, why they're interested in, in what we're doing and why they funded us. Um, so for this project, um, we've been doing uh, a couple restoration interventions. The main one we do are these rock erosion control structures. Um, and we do a lot of these, there's different types and it's hard to show in pictures the different types. Um, it's a lot easier to show in the field. So if you have questions on Thursday, I'm more than happy to point out different types of structures and, and why we did them. But um, the gist of it is we, we build these rock structures, uh, mostly in drainages. Um, they, they go perpendicular to the flow of water and they uh, really help to slow the water flow and give it time to sink into the ground. Um, they also help trap sediment. So, you know, re they really reduce erosion of the landscape and allow um, the chance for vegetation to, to replenish and, and germinate and survive. So we plant a lot of these structures and drainages and that's what we've been doing for this project across two drainages um, at the preserve. Um, and then with these structures, we also do these seed pellets. So what these are is they're native seeds, um, grass seeds and forb seeds, and we, we combine them with uh, different organic binders. Um, and basically we mix it all up and we just create these little pellets, as you can see, they look kind of like, like clay balls or something. Um, and they have, they have these seeds in them and then we distribute them actually in the rock structures and around them um, to really help, um, to really help um, you know, hold that soil in place and reestablish vegetation on site. Um, and the reason that we do it as pellets is because the, um, if we just broadcast seed, which, which we could do, um, a lot of it would get eaten you know, by little mice or other, other little critters that find those things tasty. Um, and if we put them in pellets, that really cuts back on the predation. Um, so, we, so we distribute the pellets and then when the rains come, it loosens up the binders and allows the seeds to, to germinate um, and, and gives them the best chance at, at survival. So those are the two main types of restoration. Um, and they, you know, they work, they're very synergistic. Um, they work very well together and we've been doing those uh, types of restoration in these drainages. And so far we've installed 162 rock structures um, across these two drainages. Um, and I just wanted to show you again, looking at the wildlife preserve map, where these drainages are. So this was that road on the previous map right here. That's the road, um, and this is the, the residential area down here. Um, so over here, these are this is the SJV project area. So there's the two drainages there. And the reason that those were chosen for this project um, is because first of all, this area down here, it's um, a really nice oak woodland area, a lot of quail observations there. Um, so, you know, it's a great place to, to focus on quail habitat restoration. Um, and then these two drainages in particular displayed um, high restoration needs. So, so they were actively eroding um, in some, some pretty big ways. So we really wanted to stop that. Um, and, and you know, give the landscape a chance to recover. So um, those are the areas we've been working. Um, and then with the bird surveys, we'll be doing bird surveys uh, likely in these two drainages uh, where we've done restoration work. And then we, uh, Jenny and I haven't quite figured out where else we're going to work, but we'll, we'll uh, pair that with some drainages that have not had restoration work in them. And then we can see how, you know, uh, bird, uh, species presence and abundance is different between between the um, you know areas that have restoration and those that haven't. Um, so so that'll you know help us understand um, what our erosion control work really has, what the impact is on birds. Is there one? Um, you know it'll be really interesting to find out. Um, so that's where that's where you guys come in. So um, I'm going to leave it at that and pass it off to Jenny, and she will give you more details about. Uh, the Montezuma quail, and then also the, the survey protocols themselves, so. Thank you, Tess. Yeah, so that's, that's nicely said, and it's, it's really a wonderful project, and Tucson Audubon has, it's, we have our own project with Sonoran Joint Venture, and that was part of what led to this sort of us coming together uh, 
Portland's Restoration Network and Tucson Audubon coming together is because we have this shared um, uh, sort of funder, but also like they're such good partners. Snore Joint Venture is great. If you haven't heard of them, you should really check out their website. They do amazing work all over the region. So in Southern Arizona, it's very habitat based. Southern Arizona, bits of Southern California and most of their range is actually in West Mexico, which is really very cool. And they do a lot of, they fund a lot of really great research projects and restoration projects. They're very, very cool. Okay, so I'm sharing my screen now. Um, can you guys see that? Okay. Okay, so transect and point count surveys. So this is another new thing that we're doing. Now transects are certainly not new for the Arizona Important Bird Areas Program and point counts are not new at all. Putting the two together is relatively new. And I think it's really the best way to, to survey this area and this sort of habitat structure. So um, first let's talk about Montezuma quail. Oh, wait a minute, you know what? Let me um, unshare my screen and reshare it and make sure I share the sound. I always forget to do that. And that's gonna be really important in a second. Okay, can you guys see it again? All right, so, um, so Montezuma quail, let's talk about them first. Now, when we do these surveys for regular sort of important bird areas, transect and point count surveys, I always refer to these as all species surveys. We are gonna be recording all bird species that we detect on these surveys. And now we can often have sort of a focus or a priority species, but these really are supposed to be surveys where we're documenting everything. So if you've ever helped with some of our other stuff we do, like the elf owl surveys or the elegant trogan surveys where we really are focused just on those species and we also do species lists as well but it's sort of takes a back seat to finding that primary species this is not that <laughs> this is a monitoring survey where we want to be tracking the health of these creeks and ecosystems so we want to be tracking it over time and comparing drainages that have had restoration treatment to those that have not had restoration treatment so we want to be recording all species, the little bush tits, the bluebirds, the Montezuma quail. Now the Montezuma quail is definitely a priority species, but we, so just, just keep that in mind for this protocol is we're recording all the birds. And we even have codes for many of the mammals too. So we can document mammals that we see too on the route. Now the birds are more, are the priority, but we definitely wanna be recording everything. The really common stuff we wanna be recording as well. So. But let's talk about Montezuma quail since this restoration effort is sort of focused on helping them and we would love to see their numbers increase over time. Hopefully that is what the data shows or shows higher numbers in treated drainages versus uh, non-treated. But we are just gonna go with what we find out in the field. So, um, but Montezuma quail is a priority species for the important bird areas program as well. So this really is just the perfect coming together of goals here and birders and bird surveyors love Montezuma quail. <laughs> What's not to love? They're great birds. So here's a male and a female. The female's on the left and she is quite cryptic. And the male sitting here in this photo out on the rocks looks pretty uh, obvious and they're actually not. Once they're in grassy areas, like in a more natural setting, this is sort of in a feeder area. Um, once they're in a more natural setting, those spots and stripes start blending in pretty well when you're in the grassland under the dappled shade of oak trees, which is sort of the favorite place that they like to hang out. And they're very, very cool birds. So I pulled some information from Birds of the World from Cornell, which is a really cool resource online. And I love this little summary they had, it was so funny because describing Montezuma quail to people who haven't seen them is, is always, it always takes a bit of sort of flailing to, to describe what happens. So the retiring and cryptic Montezuma quail is among the least studied birds of the perennial grassland mix with oak woodland of the American Southwest, which is a really good description of the site we're going to be at on Thursday, mixed oak woodland with grassland. Although males have bright contrasting plumage, they're almost always invisible in their grassland habit habitats. Individuals are often first detected as they leap straight up from the observer's feet and fly in a brief arching flight for 30 to 100 meters and land, usually in dense cover. This is how I have seen Montezuma quail 98% of the time I've seen them, <laughs> is I'm out there doing a bird survey or something, not looking for Montezuma quail, not even thinking about Montezuma quail. It was usually I was doing cuckoo surveys, stomping through the sort of oaky grassland, 
thinking about cuckoos, looking for cuckoos, and then having a heart attack because this bird flies right in front of your face because they, 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 they wait till you're almost on top of them before they flush right up. It's so funny. Um, people can hike for days in suitable habitat and never observe these quail unknowingly walking past many individuals. There's no doubt this is true. So we have a way of dealing with this for our survey and, and some of it has to do with timing. So they are very range restricted. Here's another nice picture of a, a male Montezuma quail. So this here is a map also from Cornell of, of the range. So the purple is where they are. They are not migratory. So purple meaning year round range. So they're mostly in West Mexico. Anyone who's familiar with a map of the ranges, the mountain ranges of West Mex of Mexico knows that this is mostly, it's a pretty good outline of the Sierra Madre a uh, collection of mountain ranges in West Mexico. So they're very much a Sierra Madre bird. And they're coming up barely into Southeast Arizona, a little bit into New Mexico, and then some scattered little areas throughout Texas and New Mexico. But this is mostly a Mexican bird and they're very rare regionally throughout the United States. So definitely a specialty bird of, of this area of Southeast Arizona for sure. So sounds and signs. So I think a lot of birders are familiar with the male call, which we'll listen to in a moment of Montezuma quail, but the female call can be extremely helpful in detecting them and figuring out where they are near you. Um, but there's another less appreciated way to find them. And this actually works really well. So this photo here, you can see, I don't know if you can see, they have sort of like these pale blue feet and their feet, are huge for the size of the bird for a little bird that's like the size of a nerf football their feet are enormous they have these huge powerful chicken feet that they use to dig so their main way of foraging for food is to go walking around on the ground sort of in the grassy area near the oak trees under the oaks shallow canyons grasslands uh, areas like that and they go around as a little sometimes a pair um in the fall and winter, often as little cubbies, little groups, they'll go around in little groups or pairs and they'll, they'll dig on the ground, sort of like chickens with really, really powerful feet. They dig an inch or so down into the ground looking for roots, tubers, acorns, grass roots to eat. And often that's one of the best ways I've found them while birding is I'm in an area that, wow, this looks really good for Montezuma quail. Lots of tall grasses. Clearly this area hasn't been overgrazed. There's oak trees, nice gentle slope. And then I'll look like, oh, look, there's like fresh digging on the ground. Little, little diggings have happened here. And then I'll sort of walk over and then a quail will like fly up in my face. Oh my God. <laughs> now, before you stomp around the area that they've been digging in, if you look really carefully, sometimes you can see them kind of crouching in there. So the, the digging thing, I think is one of the best signs to look for, to know you're close to, to where they've been. But calls by far are the best way to detect them while doing a survey. Um, they call a lot in the monsoon. Now they do call in the spring. I do hear males calling in the spring somewhat, especially in the morning when they're sort of maybe trying to attract a female or trying to bring the female back to them, sort of a reunite, you know, try to bring her where he can know that she's safe, you know, come back to him. So the male call is really loud and it carries surprisingly far, and this is what it sounds like. Can you hear that? Okay, so did you guys hear that okay? So this is the sound that most birders are familiar with since it's what's on the birding apps, is this sort of this ascending whistling sound sounds a little bit like like a UFO landing or something. It's a really weird sound. It's, it doesn't sound like anything else out, out in this habitat. And, and they do it sort of periodically. I've heard it sort of at random during the day um, in good habitat for Montezuma quail. It's just a territorial call, I think, or bringing the female back. But this sound here is one that the apps don't have. And it's the one I actually hear more in the field. So let's play this. And it's a male female interaction call. So you're going to hear a louder call, like almost like a tooting. That's going to be the female. And then there, you'll hear the male calling with his normal call, too. Okay.
Mexican Jays and Scott Sorrell too, and they're singing. The male. So that's the female doing her little sort of like it's a communication call. So how this often goes with people is you you see quail, you're like they flush. Ah, you scare them, they scared you, everyone's scared. The quail fly away. Now they often will, if it's a pair you flushed, they'll often separate, sort of maybe to increase their odds of no one chasing them like a predator, but they'll often separate and then land in the grass. They don't usually land very close to each other, like pretty close, but not right next to each other. And then you'll hear them calling. She's doing this do 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 do, and he's doing this meow call as they come closer and closer together to reunite. So there's like finding, they're sounding off to find each other. It's really distinctive and it's a really good way to find them because sometimes if you flush them and you're out birding or you, you want to see them, uh, if you listen, you can hear them tuning and you kind of get a sense of where they're going to reunite. And if you kind of sneak up on that area, sometimes you can find them, uh, see them. But it's very helpful, this sound. And I'll include, when I send the link to this video, I'll include the links to these, these audio files. There, I got these from Zeno Canto. If you're not familiar with Zeno Canto, it's a really cool website that has tons of audio files that you can utilize uh, for no charge if you're not using them for profit. It's a really cool project. So this second one is very, very long audio file, but it's, it's interactions of male and female. And it's really, really helpful to have this in mind when you're doing the survey. Okay, so I just wanted to briefly cover this area generally, like why this is so important. So Southeast Arizona is one of the most diverse places in the United States. And it has to do with, this is the main reason is we have three deserts meeting here. We have the Nearctic or the Rocky Mountain influence coming in from the North. And we also have most importantly in our case here, the Sierra Madre Occidental coming in from the South. So this is that Sierra Madre sort of Mexican, West Mexico mountain range system surging up from the South that brings us all sorts of cool birds like Montezuma quail, like elegant trogon and really cool mammals too, like javelina and coati. So it's a huge influence in this area, especially when you get down into the Patagonia area, Patagonia, Arizona. So here it is, the Sierra Madre Occidental. It's this really huge geographic feature and it, its most northerly extent ends in Southeast Arizona. So animals like elegant trogon literally island hop up this mountain range into Southeast Arizona. So it's a really important, um, feature of this area. And, and it does, I think, help to understand that with Montezuma quail, because you go down into West Mexico in the Sierra Madre region, this is the most common quail down there. So it's really pretty cool. They're rare here, but common there. So this is more close up area showing our mountain ranges. So these, these island of uh, Sky Islands, the Sky Island mountain ranges of Southeast Arizona are the furthest north extent of this much larger chain of mountain ranges south of the border. So very cool, and uh, it is right in the middle of all this action is where we're going to be doing our surveys. And this is, I like this map too, this is really fun. So someone who does GIS made this, and it shows, so it's a heat map. So the, the hotter the color, the hotter the color, the redder the color, the higher diversity. And for the lower 48 states, you have a, a surge of red along the Pacific Coast, the Gulf Coast, the East Coast, and Southeast Arizona. Boom, that's where it's at <laughs> for the lower 48. And this is because of our Sierra Madre influence coming in south of the border. It's very, very cool. Huge diversity of habitats as well. So IBA, if you're not familiar with IBA, I just wanted to cover this very briefly. The Important Bird Areas Program, uh, which is where we're getting all these protocols uh, for the, from the Arizona Important Bird Areas Program that we're gonna be surveying with, is a global program. So this is an international program headed up by Bird Conservation International out of the United Kingdom. They're very cool and they're about to do a lot more work in this hemisphere. They just announced they're having a big, huge push to do conservation in Central and South America, which Audubon's gonna be a part of, which is really exciting. But the main point of the IBA program is to identify habitats that are critical for birds of conservation need. So identify the sites that are most important for the birds that need help the most is basically the idea. There are 178 countries at least that participate in this program internationally and more than 12,000 important bird areas have been identified across the globe. And only about 40% of those have any form of protection. And in the United States, it's not very many. It's, it's like fewer than half have any sort of like legal protection. And how 
bird life kind of how bird life international handles this program internationally is they have a partner organization in each country that then under their supervision heads up the program in that country so in the united states it's the national audubon society and then in um then it breaks down by state that's how the united states has decided to do it we have a statewide program as well that then answers to the national iba program which then answers to the international iba program and in Arizona, it is headed up by Tucson Audubon Society and the National Audubon Society, the Southwest Audubon, the, the state office of national. So this is a map showing where IBAs are across the, the lower 48 states of the United States. There is quite a lot. Audubon's been very busy <laughs> over the last 15 years making IBAs, which is great. And, but Arizona's program is very, very active. Uh, we do have our own website. We have 48 important bird areas in Arizona, 19 of which have qualified as globally important sites. And it is a partnership between what was formerly called Audubon Arizona, it was now Audubon Southwest, and Tucson Audubon. We have long-standing and very appreciated funding from Arizona Game and Fish for this larger program, and we really couldn't do it without their support. But we especially couldn't do this program without the support of our over 500 volunteers. We have had a lot of people help with this program for bird surveys, especially bird surveys, outreach, data entry, data analysis. We have a couple of excellent technology volunteers that help us a lot with the website and stuff. And our purpose is both identifying IBAs and monitoring IBAs. So here's a map of where the IBAs are in Arizona. You can see here they're spread out throughout the state. Some are big, some are small, but there's definitely a huge cluster of IBAs in Southeast Arizona, because that's where a lot of the very critical habitats are. Now, zooming in closer to where we're going to be, because here's, we're going to be right in this area, like uh, Tess was showing. Now, we do have two important bird areas that are grassland IBAs, which are very significant right now, in uh, this area. So, Las Cienegas and San Rafael, we actually have Arsenal and Joint Venture Grant for Tucson Audubon to do work in the Las Cienegas uh, area with chestnut collar and long spurs, a critic, it's a totally different issue, but a critically declining bird. And we also will be utilizing sound recorders. I will be bringing a sound recorder for everyone to look at on Thursday. And so that also afterwards, Tess and I can figure out maybe where we should put <laughs> our sound recorders, but I'll be bringing one. And these are electronic devices that uh, are really cool. We've been using them for a few years at Tucson Audubon and it's an electronic way to do surveying. And I'll bring one for everybody to look at because as volunteers helping on this project, during certain times of the year, we may need help switching out batteries, switching out SD cards. And how these work is you, you it's this big green plastic thing. You attach it to a, a tree or something, to a stationary point, and you leave it there. And you program it ahead of time to turn on and turn off when you want it to. So I can tell it, okay, I want you to turn on at 5 a.m and start just recording the ambient sound. And then I want you to turn off at 10 a.m. and then turn on again at 6 p.m. and turn off again at 8 p.m. or whatever. And that's probably about what we'll do. Apologies, I don't know what's going on outside my window. Um, and uh, so that there's really very helpful. And then because Montezuma quail make a lot of noise just on their own without anybody instigating them, they're a good species to do this kind of additional supplemental surveying with. So Tucson Audubon's done a lot of bird surveying in areas like this, where we've done years and years of grassland surveying near Patagonia. Uh, we, of course, have our interest in Patagonia at the Patton Center for Hummingbirds. And we've done a lot of work with chestnut colored long spurs in this area. I have a whole other talk on that. <laughs> That's on the YouTube channel if you guys want to see that, Tucson Audubon's YouTube channel. But they're very cool birds. And this whole region is just so important for a lot of our, our native bird species. And when, once you've used your sound recorders and you've had them out on the landscape and you pull the data out of it, which is essentially just audio files that are just ambient sound of, of what's happening on the landscape, you, but you couldn't really sit there and listen to all those hours of audio and try to figure out when the Montezuma quail are calling. So what you do is you take your audio files and you run them through this software called Kaleidoscope that when you train Kaleidoscope what you're listening for, like, okay, this is the sound I want. These are Montezuma quail. This is the sound I'm listening for. This really cool software goes through all your audio files and starts pulling out hits of where it detects a similar sound. And we turn those, those hits, those audio file flags into data of sort of dates and times of when that sound was detected. So we will be doing this as well as you guys surveying in the field. 
So no, so audio recording software doesn't, or you know, the technology of sound recorders doesn't work super well by itself. I don't think not for bird surveys, but it works really well in addition to bird to like human bird surveys. They work really, really well together. So now to the surveys. If you've never helped with an important bird area survey, which is actually kind of likely these sort of regular protocol surveys, because we hadn't really been doing them that much up until very recently, and now we're going to be doing them quite a lot. So how these will work here on this site, on the uh, this wildlife corridor site, is we will be doing transects, which is sort of the most normal sort of in terms of birders wrapping their head around a bird survey, a transect seems to be the one that makes a lot of sense to people because you're essentially walking a route. So I drew this, this curvy line to show like a, a creek, a creek that's perhaps been restored, had some restoration um, improvement work happened on the creek. So you'd walk along the bank of a creek and it has a very established start point and a very established end point. And you walk this area with you and your partner and your data sheets and your clipboard your binoculars, you walk this point, you know, walk this route, the same direction every survey, the same length every survey, and you just sort of very carefully bird your way along this route, recording all the birds you see in here. So it's like really careful bird watching, rocking the same route over and over again. Because one of the keys of bird surveying, of really any kind of surveying, but bird surveying, one of the absolute keys is repeatability. You have to be starting at the same place every time and ending at the same place every time. And it has to be the sort of stop and start points that a team coming after you, like if you are on vacation and someone else has to do the survey, could do the same start and end point. So the timing of a transect survey is not super strict, but you want to make it sort of like plus or minus an hour of, of so if it's areas, if a particular day you go out and do your bird survey, like in July, is full of birds, there's so many birds everywhere. It just had a big rain, tons of birds, and it takes you an extra 40 minutes to do the route because there's so many birds to sort through. That's not a problem with a transect survey. You don't want to take like four hours longer. You want to keep it pretty within sort of the ballpark of, of about the same amount of time each time. Like you don't want to do it in 20 minutes one day and then four hours on the next visit, that kind of thing. You want to keep it pr relatively consistent, but it's not super strict. However, <laughs> the point count um, portion, <clears throat> So at the start point and the end point, we're going to be doing a second survey type, and I'll explain why in a moment, is very strict on time. And we'll talk about this in a second. But so these are stationary counts, a point count. If you've ever helped with something like the Tucson bird count or the breeding bird survey effort, this is a point count where you're standing in one location, you and your, your survey partner, or you by yourself sometimes, in one location, sort of turning on the spot, looking and listening in every direction, recording everything you see in here within either 50 or 100 meters, uh, which we'll establish on Thursday. And for a very, very rigid amount of time. So five minutes in our case. So how you're going to do these surveys, you're going to get to your start point, you're going to get everything ready on your clipboard, you're going to do your five minute point count survey on, on its own little data sheet after you have a timer on your phone or your watch or something set for exactly five minutes, record everything you've seen here, you're gonna stop after those five minutes, put that data sheet away, pull out your transect data sheets, start over. It's a new survey now. Now you're gonna be a walking survey. Do your route and repeating birds is fine if you're still detecting them on this transect survey. If that, those bridal tit mice are still going crazy in that oak over there, you can record them again. And then you do your transect survey because they're like independent surveys of each other. You do your transect survey, you get to the end point, you wrap up that transect survey, put those data sheets away, pull out a new point count survey, and you're gonna end with a five minute point count at that location. The reason we're doing this is one, Montezuma quail are so unpredictable that they may call, they may not during a five minute point count. So we don't wanna miss them. So a transect should pick them up. If sometimes standing stationary can be more helpful in listening for something like Montezuma quail. So those five minutes, you may hear Montezuma quail that you didn't hear during the, you know, two hour transect you just did, or, you know, hour and a half transect. So we're hedging our bets and doing both. And we're also doing this for statistical reasons. We want to be comparing these creeks, you know, creeks that have habitat enhancements to those that don't. And also over time, we want to be comparing this data. 
And we're right now going through some uh, consulting with statistics for our huge database we already have. And we want to make sure we have both types of data for everybody's efforts to make sure we can do some really good statistics work on all of this data that everyone's collecting and help track the, the effectiveness of these efforts, these um, habitat enhancement efforts that uh, Borderlands Restoration Network's doing. So um, I wanna just briefly, now we'll talk about this a lot in the field and I'll also send everybody their own um, set of data sheets today after this talk when I send the link to the video. So I did send everybody the written out protocol this morning. So everything that I'm gonna say here and everything that we're gonna say in the field on Thursday is in that protocol. I will bring a printed copy of everybody for, for everybody on Thursday. And I'll also have data sheets for everybody and a clipboard for everyone to use because we're all gonna be doing a survey together. <laughs> the two point counts and the transect and everything, we'll do it together. And everyone's gonna be filling out their own data sheets so that we can have, we can all feel really comfortable that we know what to do on a survey like this. So the first thing you're gonna use is your universal cover sheet. Spoiler alert, it looks like this. It's a, a piece of paper that has a lot of lines on it. And you only need one of these for your whole morning of surveying. So this just establishes the observer who was there, where the heck you were, what was the date. You'd be surprised how important this is in a bird survey. What was the name of the transect? So we'll name them once we establish them, you know, um, wildlife corridor one or whatever. So they'll be named. And then this is where you can put some weather information as well as some site comments. So this is any comments you have about the larger survey can go here. So this information right here, I pulled this directly from the protocol. So this is all right in that protocol that I sent out to everybody. But it's really important. The most important things is that you put in the name of the location. So where were you? Who was there? And when were you there? It's really what's really important about a cover sheet. And when you're done with the whole survey for the morning, this is the sheet that's going to go right on top of your packet so that when someone's doing that data entry later, they know exactly for this packet of data, data sheets, who was there, when were they there, where were they? Okay, so that's that's what a cover sheet's about. It's just sort of the, the cover of information. Transect survey. So it's most commonly used. It's a sample of space. This is a concept I always think of with transects, where point counts are a sample of time I mean, and space too. You're standing on a specific point, but a very rigid time. Transects are very rigid, rigid in space. So you have a, a very set start point and end point. You have what's known as a truncation distance, which is what this little drawing is showing that you, you're going to be recording birds that are 50 meters out to your left, 50 meters out to your right as you move forward. So it's like a rectangle of space that you're going to be recording all the birds that you detect. So it's a pretty important concept and we'll go over this a lot on Thursday. And we're also going to be going over in the field what 50 meters looks like. So we'll have a, a big, I have a big forestry tape measure and we'll also have a range finder to see exactly get a better sense of what 50 meters look like. So she says it's meters and not yards, but yeah. So we'll go over that on Thursday of exactly what 50 meters looks like. But the main point of being a, a forward walking survey doesn't have to be straight line, but it has to be moving in one direction. It can curve, but it has to move in one direction. And that we're recording birds sort of within this rectangle of space that we're moving through is sort of the basic idea of a transect. This is what a transect sheet looks like. On the first one, you do want to put the location and date again, just in case it gets separated from the cover sheet. You have a sheet one of whatever. You don't know this end number until you get to the final sheet, but it's pretty. It's very important to number your sheets. And then, uh, then you start putting down your birds. So you have your birds get listed here, whether they were audio, visual, or both, a total count, whether you estimated them, and then how far away they were. Were they zero to 50 meters or 50 to 100? We don't require you to put an exact distance. It's like a distance parameter category. Were they male, female, juvenile, uh, other habitat code, which we'll talk about on Thursday. And then breeding behavior code, which is important. And then if you have any comments about that bird, you can put it here. Now, a really important concept too with transects, with our surveys versus eBird, because you might be thinking, why aren't they just using eBird? That'd be a great way to do this. And we do use eBird a lot, but we don't use it for this because it's pretty important for our statistical analysis that we keep track of individual parties. If you have a group of three Montezuma quail over here, and then you go a little further and you have four more over there, 
they each get their own lines. Birds that are not associated with each other, birds that are not a pair, they're not in a little family group or like a, a, like a flock together, birds that are separate, even if they're the same species in this survey protocol, they get their own line. And that just has to do with analyzing the data. It also has to do with sometimes breeding behavior codes can be different for those different groups of birds. So there's a lot of reasons to keep them separate. These are levels of detail that eBird cannot accommodate because eBird will just lump them all together like Christmas bird count style. We'll just, if you say, I got three Montezuma quill over there and four over there, it just makes it seven, which we need a finer level of detail in our data. So that's, that's why we do it that way. And that written, like that typed up protocol I sent makes a huge deal about that, keeping these groups separate. So point counts are you stand in one spot for five minutes and record all that you see in here. It's a sample of time. Um, and birds flying over the habitats, you kind of think of it as like, you're the little center of the circle. And then there's a radius of 50 meters going in every direction around you. And every bird that's in that circle within those five minutes that you detect should be recorded. So, and then there's this concept of flyovers and supplementals, which we'll talk about in a second because I have a next, I have a slide about this, but just keep those terms in mind, flyovers versus supplementals. So supplementals are exactly what they sound like. They're extra birds, they're supplemental birds, um, birds that are not technically in for the survey, whether it be their location, they're maybe a little too far away from the truncation line to be in, or they're maybe behind your start point or beyond your end point. Um, or they can be extra just in time. Like you finish the survey, you're walking back to your car, you see a really cool bird, you can record those, but they're supplemental. And we have a way to put that on the data sheet because it's very important that they not be counted as birds that were sort of in during the survey time. Now point counts handle flyovers differently than transects handle flyovers. And this is just a protocol thing from back in the day where so a flyover is a bird that is flying higher than the highest habitat feature or tree. So I don't mean like a phainopethla flying from one tree to another. That's not a flyover. Flyovers is like when you see a turkey vulture that's just like zooming over the transect area and they're not really utilizing the space, the habitat that you're surveying. So birds that are just literally just flying over, just zooming over like a little airplane, just out higher than the tallest tree and just on their way to somewhere else, just transiting through is, is a flyover. So in transects, those are considered supplemental. In a point count, if that happens, if a bird flies over, even if it looks like it is not utilizing that point count at all, you still record them, but their distance zone goes in as FO for flyover. The protocol makes a huge deal about that. We'll talk about it on Thursday in person as well, but it's definitely, what I think of besides the standing versus walking thing, <laughs> it's one of the biggest differences between a point count and a transect is the way flyovers are handled. Um, one thing that often confuses people is birds like swallows that are aerially foraging, like flying in a flock feeding above an area that you're surveying, they are utilizing that habitat. I would not consider those flyovers. They're flying around, but they're using the habitat. They're part of that little habitat ecosystem uh, that you're surveying. So I would count them. If there are swifts that are on migration that are really high in the sky, just zooming through, then those might be flyovers. Yeah. So here's a point count sheet. It looks remarkably like a transect sheet, <laughs> but it has a little bit of differences just in that um, it has audio visual instead of audio visual both, which the protocol talks about because there is no both in point counts. It's how you first detected them, which the data sheet explains. These data sheets were laid out to try to help lead people to doing it correctly out in the field. So the sheets are trying to be as helpful as possible when we designed them many years ago. Uh, and then of course you mark the time, zero to five minutes and then any comments. So yeah, supplementals, I pulled this right from the protocol. And so these are birds that are either too far away or not in either before your start point or after your end point or after your time ends or even before your time begins. And I just explained all this. <laughs> so flyovers uh, are birds that are flying higher than the highest feature on the landscape. But um, this should be sort of looked at closely in your protocol document. Um, and we can talk about it at length as well as the philosophies of this on Thursday. But it is a pretty important concept, uh, especially when you're thinking about your species total. Now you do not need to be recording supplementals on everything. 
So common birds that you already got during the survey. Okay, great. You're detecting more bush tits on the way back to the car. You don't need to necessarily record that. I mean, you're welcome to, you can, but don't feel like you have to. It's mostly for unusual species or maybe like a new bird for the day. Like you say, you see a Scots Oriole on the way back. Like, oh my gosh, we didn't have a Scots Oriole today. That's awesome. Put it down as a supplemental. And that helps contribute to the sort of overall species list but it doesn't impact the integrity of the data. So that's why we do supplementals. It lets us get a sense of what's going on without changing our true sense of what was seen during that survey. Now, another really important thing I wanna say here, and I'm gonna say it again on Thursday, is when you're in the field, when you're doing um, a bird survey, you want to sort of, I, I empower you now. <laughs> you want to have walk around with the idea that no one in the history of the world is ever gonna have more information about what is happening during that bird survey than you while you're there. So I have people sometimes write long extensive accounts of something that happened. Oh, I saw this bird, it was doing this. Should I count it as a pair or was it a single bird or whatever, something like that, where they're trying to have me decide what should have been reported in the data sheets, but I wasn't there. and you, the person who was there, is the most qualified person to make that judgment call. So you've got to go with your gut. If you think that this varied bunting here in the field, that male, is a new one, you're pretty, you are, you feel confident that that is not the same bird that you had 10 minutes ago, go ahead and write it down. You got to go with your gut, because I can't, I can't know for you what, what's going on, right? So so this is, I think, a really, I really want to try to empower all of us to, to make these decisions in the field, since no one will ever know as much of us as, as we did while we were standing out there with our clipboard. If, if you think you heard a Montezuma quail and you feel confident, like over 90% confident, and you feel, you feel like you did, go ahead and record it. You know, don't leave it up to me. It's up to you. So that's just a, another, and I'm going to say that again on Thursday, because I think it's a really important um, concept for, for bird surveying. Codes is something I want to cover briefly. I will have code sheets for everybody to keep, to take home, that I'll have a printout for everybody. And I'll show you too on our clipboards. I, I tend to attach them to my clipboards, these, these code sheets. I think they're extremely helpful to have in the field. Um, and I just literally use clear packing tape to put them on my clipboards <laughs> so I can reference them when I'm in the field. So Codes, we have codes for general behavior. This is like FT for foraging and tree, that kind of thing. So these are like behavior codes that have nothing to do with breeding, just sort of behavior, like mostly foraging. Uh, and then we do have breeding codes, which are very important. If you've ever used those eBird breeding codes, we use the same codes. They're standardized codes across breeding bird surveys. So like ON for occupied nest, C for, for a courtship. Like these are really, established codes. Thank goodness someone established these codes early on. And we use the same standard codes and I'll have a code sheet for you guys too to, to keep. And then we have habitat codes, which are like grassland and urban and, you know, abandoned field, things like that. So sometimes that's important in the data sheet to report a habitat. But the codes that people encounter the most in bird surveys are banding codes. So these are four letter codes that ref reference the species name of a bird. These can get very contentious with people and I and biologists throw them around all the time. Biologists love banding codes and I find myself using them sometimes. Now banding codes, four letter birding codes, which are originally were created for banding, which is why people call them banding codes, follow this pretty normal pattern of most birds names are two words, not all. <laughs> some are three words, some are one word. Most birds have two word names. So morning dove. So the standard way, the way that 80% of these codes work is you take the first two letters of the first word and the first two letters of the second word and slam them together. So morning dove becomes mo do. Lesser goldfinch because lay go. There's a lot of exceptions and they're the ones that just throw everyone for a loop. So canyon wren and um, cactus wren both would be C-A-W-R. You obviously can't have two birds with the same code. That's obviously not going to work. Because when you do data entry, you have no idea which bird they saw. So then those break the pattern. And that's what always happens is if it's if there's a conflict like that, two, two birds have, would have the same code, they have to 
break the pattern. So then cactus rent is CACW and canyon rent is CANW. I would urge you <laughs> to not guess on birding, on bird species name banding codes. If you are not sure, don't guess. Regular, regular abbreviations are totally fine. So if it's Northern Cardinal that you're seeing and you're not sure what the code is, you can do N period card. Anyone doing data entry is gonna know you mean Northern Cardinal. But if you try to guess and you get it wrong and there's only four letters there, it's really hard for someone to figure out exactly what you meant. So I will have sort of a list of banding codes for everyone to keep on Thursday to take home. Also the Sibley birding app. If you look at any species, if you notice the banding code, the four letter code is right there on the, on the species profile of, the, of, the, of every bird. And they're very standardized. So banding codes, it becomes a bit of a bugaboo for people, but I think they're really helpful with really common stuff. If you know those four letter codes, like the birds you encounter all the time, and then you can write them down a lot faster. But if you're not sure, just use some sort of regular abbreviation or write the whole name out if you'd like. So then these are those, I'll have these for you guys on Thursday. Um, reading behavior codes, habitat codes. And the last thing I wanted to cover on PowerPoint before we do questions and discussion is getting to the site on Thursday. So the uh, BWP the, um, is located approximately two and a half miles north of Patagonia. And, and Tess, I'm sure, may have something to add to this. Two and a half miles north of Patagonia on the west side of Highway 82. So I'll be coming from Tucson. So when I'm headed down 82, the entrance is on my right. And it's between mile marker 22 to 23 across from Sonoida Springs Ranch. So that's a pretty prominent gate with a big sort of sign on top. So Sonoida Springs Ranch is kind of right across from that. It's Tanglehead Lane. I also noticed that this uh, Borderlands Wildlife Preserve is in Google Maps as a feature. So you can kind of navigate right to it if you'd like to. So you're going to turn on Tanglehead Lane at the Wildlife Corridor sign, which is pretty obvious. It's on, it's on the, when I'm coming from Tucson on the right side, but it's this sign, this is Wildlife Corridor with like yucca stalks coming up. It's a really pretty sign, really nice metal sign. You turn there and we're going to, uh, yeah, with the sign and enter the preserve. You're going to go down that road a little bit and there's a, a dirt parking area that's pretty large and getting to that parking area and Tess can confirm this for us is suitable for all, all cars. And we're going to do our original stuff of doing like measuring lengths and stuff. We'll do that in that parking lot. But then from there, we're going to go to an actual creek to do a real survey. And to get to that site does require high clearance. So if you do not have high clearance, um, <clears throat> we can accommodate you. My car, I have an Xterra, I can take three. I am vaccinated and I am more than willing to put a mask on um, if it makes my passengers comfortable. So I can take three, Tess can take some in her vehicle. So if you don't have a suitable vehicle for this practice, don't worry, we can still get you to the, the site where we're gonna be doing the survey practice. So I'm going to, oh, I think I have one more little like cute little question thing. Okay. So I'm going to now stop sharing my screen and we can have a discussion now. So go ahead and unmute yourself, everybody. And we can, if you'd like to, if you have a question and Tess, do you have anything to add? Yeah. So um, a couple things. First of all, I think, I think I'll also be able to take three with me. Um, I'll have a truck. Um, so, so I can take a few. Um, and then also that parking area, um, so yeah, as you come in, you'll see it. It's right on the left and it's actually gravel, um, the material. Um, and there's a kiosk there and I, I'm sure you'll see all of us parked there. So it, it's pretty easy to find. Um, but yeah, that, that's, that's all. Fine. Does anybody have, so um, have any questions right now about the protocol? I know it's, a, it's weird to do it over a computer. It's much easier in person. So we'll, when we do that in person, I think it'll hopefully make a lot more sense. Oh, I see Paula. Paula raised your hand. Yes, Paula. I can't hear you, Paula. It's weird because it doesn't show you as being muted. Hmm. Can you maybe type your question? about now? I can hear you. Yes. Don't know what that was about. Um, I'm curious when you assign the various transects to various volunteers, are you going to assign like one study and one control to each volunteer or? That's definitely what I was thinking of doing. Yes. 
um, to sort of for, for bias reasons or just sort of as a nice paired study. Yes, that's what I was thinking of doing. Um, and this is something we can sort of work because this is the first time we've tried anything quite like this as, as choose not about or, or, you know, at, at all. And so we can, I'd be very interested in people's sort of opinions. We can kind of work this out together, but I think it, if, and I'd have to talk with Tess too, if, if that works, if there are um, untreated creeks close enough to treated creeks that we could pair them and have it so that it's a, it's a morning of doing two transects of moderate length and then the four point counts associated with those two transects. So, you know, the two associated with each one as sort of a morning of surveying and then maybe alternate back and forth, which one you do first would be a really good way to get rid of bias. Um, that is what I was thinking of doing. Yes, Paula, because I think that would work really well in terms of data analysis. And another thing I forgot to mention is the timing of these surveys. <laughs> So, and I had this in the description of the event, but the most, these surveys are supposed to happen five times a year, but if you are not available all those times, we can be switching in and out, you know, of having, you know, staff or, or other people cover routes when you're not available. So it's not a deal breaker if you're not here year round, or if you want to go on vacation, that's totally fine. But how we're timing these surveys is to do sort of two during the monsoon one in early July, one later in August. And this is when they tend to breed, the Montezuma quail. And it's when, it's when this whole area though is so active with tons of birds. We will do a um, sort of that late August one will capture some of the fall migration too. Then we might do another fall survey, then a winter survey and then a spring survey. So that totals into five. So two monsoonal, a spring, an autumn and a winter survey as well to capture the other species, you know. And Montezuma quail are year round. So they could be on any of those time periods, but um, they're going to be most vocal during the monsoon. So do we have any other questions? Is there any hunting allowed on that preserve? No. No, yeah, that was, that's what I, I, my understanding too, is that there's no hunting allowed, it's private land. But one of the really interesting partners that I had been dealing with sort of tangentially about something else that I found out was involved in this project is Quail Forever. They're a really interesting group, a sportsman group, and they are putting a lot of volunteer time into these. Uh, this is right. It's, correct me if I'm wrong, Tess, but it's my understanding from their chapter head that they've been putting a lot of uh, volunteer time into helping to build these, these um, habitat improvement structures and some funding as well into the project because they like to do things that help quail, whether they can hunt them there or not. They're pro quail. So even though there's no hunting allowed, it does have a lot of sort of sportsman support. So, yeah, so we do have, yeah, that's definitely right. We do have a partnership with them and they have provided us a lot of funding um, to do some restoration work, but that's actually a different project um, over in the Huachucas on um, okay. Forest Service land where there is, hunting is allowed. Um, but they have, they have come out um, to this, this site at Borderlands Wildlife Preserve and they've done some volunteer work there. Most of their volunteer work has been in the Huachucas, but they have come out here to help us out. So yeah, they're, they're a great partner um, for us, for sure. Yeah, they have hunting dogs that help you locate them if you need it. Right? That's right, yeah, <laughs> yeah. that's true. <laughs> and that's actually how Game and Fish does their Montezuma quail studies, is they use dogs. To, to help flush oh, them get more accurate counts. We're not going to be doing that though. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Paula. I see Paula has has raised okay. raised a hand. I have about when the around control was put in, and oh, I'm curious. Breaking up a little bit. Okay. Can detect any visual distinction on erosion control versus control. Yeah, that's a good question for tests. Do they look different, the ones that have had? I mean, obviously, you can see the rock structures. Right, yeah. So, um, yeah, so the, the rock structures are the main thing. And unfortunately, 
So um, the we started the installation of the structures in late 2019. And then of course, last summer, we didn't really have much of a monsoon season. And normally when we have a good monsoon season, that's when we start to see, you know, some sediment accumulation behind the structures. That's when we start to be able to establish vegetation in these areas. Um, so unfortunately, because we didn't have a great monsoon season last year, um, there's not much sediment that's accumulated or much vegetation that's that's really grown since we just haven't had the rains. Uh, but in general, after after a good monsoon season, you can definitely see the difference between um, treated drainages versus controls, but unfortunately not so much in this case. It kind of makes it a nice beginning for our survey efforts too. <laughs> it's almost like when the first monsoon is like that's when maybe the the habitats might start to diverge. Sure, yeah. yeah. Sure. So go ahead, Rex. I see you you raised your hand. Yeah, um, interesting comment about uh, how dogs are used to monitor quail. Um, I've been out to this uh, survey area several times and there are a lot of dog walkers um, um, various times of the day. And so I'm just wondering um, how we would accommodate that or if somebody's walking their dog when we're starting a, a survey, we just wait or, or what we would do. And as part of that too, there's, do we make note of, uh, of predators? Because um, in that area, I, I have seen, you know, these giant snakes um, that are there. Um, and I assume there's all sorts of other predators. Do we make note of, of sighting of any of those as, as in our comments or what would we do with that? So for the predators question or like any other animals besides birds question, we do have codes and the, sheet of bird codes I'm going to give you guys does have them on there, but you can also just write it in coyote or whatever. Uh, our database yeah. does accommodate. We have, cr we've created almost as if like we trick the database into thinking they're birds, but we have coyote, you know, gray fox, several snakes, Gila monster, things like that in the system. So we can enter those. Yes. And they would show up on the species list when you pulled a query report. Um, which is the last thing I forgot to mention. All this data does go into an, a da an access database that lives here at Houston Audubon and that is then available on our website. So you can go in and once the data has been entered, you can pull reports, download little Excel spreadsheets, whatever of the data that's living in the database. So uh, those animals that are not birds, yes, we definitely wanna be documenting those. Now in terms of dog walking, Tess will know better if that's gonna be an issue where we will be surveying. So I don't think it will, and I might actually pass that off to Choya Nickel. Um, she's <laughs> our <laughs> lead wildlife tech out there, so she knows the wildlife preserve better than anyone. Um, so Choya, the I'm not sure if you have a good idea where the area is. It's over by the Badlands. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, there shouldn't be anybody walking dogs in there. They're not allowed in the preserve. <laughs> uh, we've recently put up a lot more signage than there was before, Rex. So I'm hoping that you saw that activity a, a little while ago. Yeah. Um, if we do encounter a dog, I will kindly ask them to leave the area with their dog. And there are dog-friendly trails. They, they're welcome to stay on the, um, in kind of the residential area where there's a little development. They can walk their dog there. And there's other dog friendly trails in town that I can uh, direct them to, but there shouldn't be dogs out there. They Hopefully. definitely would affect quail too, I would think. It certainly would affect our detectability because I I even know a chihuahua that is pretty good at spotting Montezuma quail. And that's the kind of bias <laughs> that you really don't want. Yeah, Linda knows. that. That's the kind of bias you don't really want in a survey because if you're if you're detecting quail better than you would on your own, that can like really skew the data. You know, if there's a dog around flushing them up or like pointing at them and then you see them or, or making the quail nervous and they call or something like that. So that's a really good question that I had not thought of. <laughs> Thank you, Rex. Okay. Um, any, any other uh, questions, guys? All right, so this was a, um, this session has been recorded and um, this will be made available online. I'll send this link out to you all as well as the protocol, no, you already got the protocol, but the, the data sheet, if you're on copy of the data sheets and the code sheets, and, uh, and I will have printed versions of all that for you guys to keep on Thursday. And if you're watching this recording at a later date for a different session, um, then we have probably made plans to meet in the field at a different time, because uh, I will be offering other opportunities to do sort of the field practice for folks who, who are not yet involved in the project or who can't make it on Thursday.
Thursday. So if that's you, if you can't make it on Thursday and you want to be a part, do a field training later in the summer, I am thinking mid July as part of an actual survey, um, let me know and we will sort that out. But uh, I've had a few questions about would this work? Is that, am I qualified? And we can sort almost anything out. If you can identify birds of this habitat, of this region by sight and sound, we would love to have your help on this survey. And if you're able to physically walk over on even ground, we can find a way to, to make it work and accommodate you. Okay. All right. Well, thank you all so much. I really appreciate it. This is going to be, I'm really excited to do this sort of new effort. So I really appreciate all of you guys' help in, in doing this. This really important component of bird surveying, which isn't just going to the same national park area that never changes and surveying it over and over again, which is a lot, we've done a lot of that, but somewhere that actually has a lot of restoration work that maybe we can use these bird, this bird data to monitor the effectiveness of that, which is something we've done too, but never quite like this. So I'm really excited to be doing this uh, with you all. So thank you so much. And I'll see you at uh, 7 a.m. Um, in Patagonia, near Patagonia on Thursday morning. And I'll be there a little early if anyone wants to come early and speak with me about anything. Okay. All right, well, thank you thank so you. much, Rosanna. Yeah, thank, thank you, you all so much. Bye. See you guys. Bye.